I was very pleased to be able to have Dr. Howard Schubler come to us. Just a little bit about him is he actually came from Wayne State and did professor work there for 18 years and then went on to Providence Hospital, which is where he is now. He has published more than 60 different publications. So please help me warmly welcome Dr. Schubner. Thank you guys, thanks for having me. So I work uh, with people with chronic pain. And uh, have you ever been in pain? Have you known people who've had pain? Do you take care of people who have pain? Chronic pain is an epidemic in this country and worldwide. The Institute of Medicine released a big report last year stating that over 100 million Americans have had chronic pain, which seems crazy. How could there be that many people? There's only 300 and some million people in, in the country. I saw a kid this morning who's 19. He's been in pain since he was 12. No one can explain why he's in pain. He's had a, a very extensive medical workup and testing, and it didn't reveal the cause of his pain. So his pain is being treated as the disease called chronic pain. But our treatment, as you'll see, for the disease called chronic pain isn't always that good. And about 12 years ago, I learned some stuff about pain that shocked me and amazed me and blew me away because it was looking at pain in a way that different than what I'd been trained for my 20 years of being a doctor. Because we think in medicine of pain kind of as a static process. We think it's, well, you have pain, you have chronic pain, so there's something wrong. And if we can't find it and if we can't fix it, which unfortunately is often the case with chronic pain, therefore you have chronic pain. And what I learned was that pain can be a dynamic process, a changeable process, and that the brain has tremendous influence on pain. So how powerful is the mind? Are you aware that the mind can cause paralysis? Are you aware of that? Do you know what we call that? Anyone? Psychologists here? Conversion disorder. I saw a teenager a few years ago who he had hip pain and then his pain went to his chest and then he had headache pain and then he had uh, other pain and then Things were getting worse and worse in his life, and the stress was building up, and finally his arm and leg went dead, went paralyzed. And then the leg got better, and all the tests were normal. The leg got better, and then his arm would be paralyzed. He'd wake up in the morning, his arm was fine. He'd go to school, he'd get to school, arm dead. Kids are teasing him at school, bullying him at school. He gets out of school, 3.30, arm fine. Unbelievable. The mind is that powerful. Can the mind cause cardiogenic shock? Yes. There's a syndrome called broken heart syndrome. Have you heard of it? Have you seen anyone with that? It's amazing. Surprise birthday party. Surprise! Oh my God. <laughs> and the heart just stops, pump not stops, but gets, starts pumping weaker and weaker. And they can end up in the intensive care unit. And then they get better. This huge outpouring of catecholamines from the stress from the brain can cause the heart to do that. It's well known. Can the mind cause death? We hope not. But people die from voodoo. Right? You can die from voodoo if you really believe in voodoo. Contagious. Can, can symptoms be contagious from one to another? Can pain be contagious? I've seen people who read an article about carpal tunnel and their hand starts hurting. And I can tell you lots of stories about the contagiousness of pain. I went to a big medical center last year, pain, pain center, and I said, you know, pain can be contagious. They looked at me like I was crazy. Because their view of pain is it's a static process caused by a structural abnormality in the brain. And that can happen. But there's another form of pain. <coughs> That's a mind-body pain. That is incredibly common. 
Can the brain cause hallucinations? Oliver Sacks wrote a whole book about hallucinations and how common they are in normal people. Have you ever, this is, the, this is the most common hallucination in modern life, have you ever had the sensation that your cell phone was vibrating in your pocket and when you looked at it, it wasn't? I've had that. It ha it's pretty common. It's amazing. Someone's call I think someone's calling me right now. <laughs> And so the mind is powerful enough to cause symptoms that are caused by stress. This is a guy published in the British Medical Journal. I don't know if you can see. This is a nail going through his boot. He jumped off a scaffolding in 1995 and had tremendous pain. Off the charts, screaming and writhing all the way to the hospital. They gave him IV narcotics, IV sedation, didn't touch his pain. They ripped his boot off and they found the nail right between his toes. <laughs> no injury. Severe pain. One of the first things that we do is try to figure out what's causing the pain. But that's been done. All my patients have been to medical testing, medical workups, medical treatment have been to the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic, have been all over the place to try to find the cause, the medical cause. Just give me, just operate on me. Just, you know, just do something. But when you get to the point of chronic pain treatment, what we end up saying is chronic pain is a disease state and we will help you cope with it. But chances are we're not gonna make it just disappear. We don't have magic. And so we do multimodal treatment, which is, makes perfect sense. Let's try a lot of different things. So surgery for back pain. Well, when you do research and compare fusion back surgery versus cognitive therapy and exercises, there's no difference. When you do early discectomy versus waiting and no surgery, over time, there's no difference. So there's five studies for back pain surgery that show that surgery is not better than non-surgical treatments for, for low back pain. That doesn't mean it doesn't work because you see people are getting better with both. It's not to say surgery doesn't work. It's to say surgery isn't working better than the non-surgical treatments, if you see what I mean. Why do we keep doing surgery? Because it works. People get better. Not everyone, of course. Uh, how about radicular pain? Bulging disc, herniated disc, pain shooting down the leg. Surgery would, would work pretty well for that, you would think. The biggest trial, sport trial, almost 300 people, randomized controlled trial. When you do the intention to treat analysis, which is the most conservative way of doing the analysis, surgery wasn't better than non-surgical approaches. So there's a guy in Los Angeles in the early 90s who decided for some reason to look at his surgical patients for back pain. And they all needed surgery for back pain because he wouldn't have done surgery if they didn't need surgery for back pain. They had abnormalities on, on their backs and their MRIs. And he said, well, some people don't do as well as others. So he did a little analysis and he asked them five questions. Did your parents divorce or were you abandoned or neglected as a child? Was either your parents using, uh, abusing drugs or alcohol? Did you have physical abuse? Did you have sexual abuse? Did you have emotional abuse? So five measures of childhood adversity. And then he looked at his outcomes. Those who had none of the childhood adversity, 95% of them did great with surgery. Those who had one or two of these risk factors, 73% did great with surgery. Those who had three or more of these childhood risk factors had a 15% success rate with back surgery. And it makes you wonder, is it something other than the back that we may be dealing with in these patients? Those are my patients. Those are the people that I see. How about injections for back pain? Well, again, why are we doing thousands, millions of injections for back pain in this country because they work. People get relief. 
It might be temporary, but people get relief. But when you compare injections versus placebo injections, there's no difference. The placebo injections work as well as the regular injections. And we're talking about meta-analysis where there's large numbers of studies pooled together. Another big review, 18 studies, uh, no strong evidence for or against the use of any type of injection therapy. Again, because they're comparing it to placebos. Next. Medications. Medications can be very helpful for pain. We use narcotics for pain, oftentimes in this country. One of the problems with long-term narcotic use is not only addiction and overuse and spreading into the society, the number of deaths due to narcotic overdose has tripled in the last decade, but narcotics can cause a hyperalgesia. They can cause a sensitization of the brain to pain, actually in a sense making pain worse over time. How about alternative therapies? Acupuncture can be very helpful for painful conditions. But when you compare acupuncture to sham acupuncture, there's little difference between the two. How about psychological treatment for chronic pain? That would make sense. That's what I'm getting at, right? This is a big, busy slide, but the bottom line is that cognitive behavioral therapy and behavioral therapies have shown to have weak effects in improving pain. For fibromyalgia, cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to have some effects on mood and disability, but in reducing pain about a, a roughly a half of a point on a 10 point pain scale. So not huge effects, small effects. Positive effects, but small effects. And for low back pain, similar findings. Oftentimes what I've seen as I've gotten into the world of pain is the psychological treatments for pain tend to be help you cope with the pain, help you be more functional with the pain, which is important, and, and I do that, and it's necessary. But it's often not sufficient from my point of view because what I'm trying to discern is, is the brain causing the pain in the first place or not? If it is, then maybe the psychological treatment could be directed to curing the pain or resolving it as opposed to coping with it. And the other thing that I found is that much of the uh, social work and psychology world has been trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is an efficacious form of therapy. But it doesn't always deal with emotions. And emotions are at the core of chronic pain. So patients want to know, number one, what's causing it and can we make it go away? So I have a simplified version of understanding pain. One, is it caused by tissue damage? Or two, is it caused by a neural pathway? Everyone knows that tissue damage can cause pain, and I work very hard at trying to determine if my patients have a tissue damage problem or not. When someone comes to me with pain in their hip, and I look at the x-ray and I examine their hip, and they need a new hip, they need a new hip. If they have pain shooting down their leg, and they have a foot drop, and the reflex isn't working, and the muscle strength is down, then there's some pressure on that nerve. That's obvious to me and to their doctors. But the majority, the vast majority of patients that I see have neural pathway pain. So what's a neural pathway? When you learn how to ride a bicycle, your brain creates a whole network of neurons that form into this ability to ride a bicycle. It's a very complex process. Once you learn it, the more you practice it, it gets ingrained. And then pretty soon you never forget it. It's there at the drop of a hat. And how often do we use neural pathways in our everyday? Why am I doing this as opposed to that or this, or, right? These are neural pathways. How we laugh, how we smile, how we brush our teeth, how we walk. Five plus five is 10. There's millions of these neural pathways we're using all the time. And pain can be a neural pathway. So I saw a physician 
who was in Vietnam as a, in the late 60s, and he was in a firefight, and there was gore and blood, and he got shrapnel wounds to his leg and got medevaced out, and a lot of his buddies died or were maimed. And he had pain and limping in his left leg, which lasted for several months. He got rehab, got home, he was fine. Pain gone, limping gone. Goes to medical school, becomes a doctor. 20 years later, he's walking down the street with his wife, and all of a sudden, he has the same pain in his left leg and the same limping that he had 20 years ago with the injury. And he tells his wife, this is, this is crazy. Where's, what's going on? And she says, you know, that's weird, but do you hear that? There's this helicopter buzzing by. That's weird. He had an injury which became learned, just like we learn anything, in his brain that created a pain memory. And that pain memory was triggered 20 years later by something that happened. Pain can be a neural pathway. And what I tell my patients is, you also have neural pathways of no pain. Our brain is connected to every cell and fiber of our bodies all the time. And all those pathways are going on. And most of them are working just fine, no pain. So injury causes a signal which goes to the brain. And the brain interprets that signal as either danger or no danger. Have you ever seen a kid skin his knee? and then cry when the mother comes running, but not when they skin their knee? Because the brain is interpreting danger or no danger. The brain can turn off pain, physical pain that's caused by an injury, by turning off the danger signal. When the danger signal is activated, that's what causes pain. All pain occurs in the brain, whether it's due to an injury or whether it's not due to an injury. A physical threat or an emotional threat activates the danger signal in the brain, which can activate pain. So there's a lot of back pain and neck pain in this country. It's estimated 85% of people will have back pain or neck pain at some point in their life. And a lot of times it's because of an injury and it gets better. But sometimes it becomes chronic. And when pain becomes chronic, you get an MRI. And when you get an MRI, guess what you find? Chances are your MRI is going to be abnormal because MRIs are abnormal in people who have no pain. This is a study, and there's a dozen or so studies now of adults who have no pain who get MRIs for the purpose of a study. And what they find is that the majority of middle-aged and older adults have abnormal MRIs. And that includes bulging discs, herniated discs, protruding discs, arthritis, all sorts of things. And there's a study done recently in 21-year-olds in Denmark, and 50% of them had evidence of degenerative disc disease. These are healthy, normal 21-year-olds. And 25% had bulging discs. MRI abnormalities are normal. You can't tell who has pain by looking at the MRI. I've been to so many radiologists and I look and they say, oh, there's the pain they're looking at. There it is. So when you get an MRI, if you have pain, what's the doctor going to tell you? Oh, we found it. There's the source of the pain. They may not tell you that these same findings are seen in people who don't have pain. This is a lady I saw several years ago. She came in with back pain, no leg pain, back pain. Her exam was perfectly normal, no reflexes were normal, strength was normal, everything was fine. And how would you, what would you think if someone said, here's your MRI, this is your back. Look, at two levels, the nerve roots are being compressed due to bulging discs. That doesn't look good, right? This is scary. She was scheduled for surgery. She came to see me for I don't know why. And I said, you know, your exam's normal. And I took her life history. And it seemed like the pain began, that she had issues in her early life. I'll talk about that. The pain began at a time when she was having more issues in her life. And the emotional and the physical came together. And she's had pain for nine years. Her pain went away in two weeks, totally gone. She didn't need surgery. 
She called me six months later because her pain had come back. I said, oh, really? What happened? Did you fall? Did you trip? Did you injure yourself? She said, no. It started in 10, around uh, noon, and at 10 a.m. that morning, we got a letter from the Department of Defense that my daughter was being deployed to Iraq. I think that's what caused my recurrence of pain. She had this knowledge that pain could be caused by something other than a structural disease process. So what I do is try to sort this out. The last thing I want to do is tell people they have a mind-body problem or a neural pathway problem when in fact they have a structural abnormality. I don't want to do that. That's, that fills me with fear. That causes me to have back pain. <laughs> so I do the neurologic exam. I try to determine is this pain related to the MRI findings or not? Is the pain consistent or does it vary? Does it shift from one side to the other? Does it, is it better when you do this and worse when you do that? Is it consistent? I have a friend who's a psychologist who does this work in, in California. And he was having heel pain. He said, uh, he called me up. He said, I know. I must have done something to my heel. It's tender to touch. When I push it, it hurts. Every time I walk on it, it hurts. Sounds like, I said, yeah, sounds like you might have something wrong with your heel. And he said, you know, but it's funny that two nights ago, I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I woke up, I walked to the bathroom, went back. Didn't hurt at all, it was fine. I said, aha! <laughs> We've caught it. <laughs> and so you know what he did? He said, oh my God, that's what it is. So he started walking. He walked back and forth. You know what he said to himself? I'm fine. There's nothing wrong. Stop it. Everything's cool. There's, I'm okay. Fifteen minutes later, pain gone. He had made the diagnosis that this was a neural pathway problem, and then he had treated it by changing how he thought about it and how he treated it. It's shocking. What I find is that as people get older, the stress in their life goes up. And oftentimes, the early stress is the key. So let's take a typical patient that I might see would be a woman who as a child had, let's say, an emotionally abusive father. Could be even worse, but let's just say emotionally abusive father. No symptoms as a child. This is what she's used to. At 15, she gets a boyfriend. He's nice initially, but then he becomes emotionally abusive, spreads pictures, lies about her, showing pictures around the school and sleeps with her best friend and her other friends shun her and all of a sudden she's got migraine headaches. And when she's 25, she marries a guy who turns out to be emotionally abusive, maybe physically abusive, harsh with her children, and she gets stomach pain, irritable bowel syndrome, pelvic pain. And then when she's 35, she divorces the jerk, but he's still trying to not pay his child support or turn the kids against her. And then she gets in a car accident, a little fender bender, and her neck goes like that. And then she gets neck pain. And then the pain spreads from her neck down to her back and to her arms. And then she gets anxiety and depression. And by the time she sees me, she has a list this long of disorders that are all part and parcel, and none of them are you know, cancer or kidney stones or something that's a structural abnormality. Can the brain create pain? It turns out it can. A study from Pittsburgh shows that physically induced pain and hypnotically induced pain are actually exactly the same in the brain. The pain that my patients have and your patients have is real. There's no such thing as imaginary pain. Fibromyalgia is real. The pain is real. It is not a disease in the body. The tissues of the body are normal. So something's going on in the brain. And what we call it, I call it neural pathway pain, but a lot of my colleagues call it central pain sensitization syndrome. And it turns out that people with back pain have the same amplified evidence of amplified pain when you study their brains. And it turns out that when you give people physical pain and scan their brain, you see what happens. And when you give people emotional pain, this was done at University of Michigan, 
And they did that by showing them a picture of an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend who had dumped them in the past six months. That is a cruel study to do. <laughs> but it turns out the emotional pain causes the exact same pathways in the brain to light up as the physical pain. In UCLA, they did a series of studies and they made people feel socially excluded by playing a computer game and then socially excluding them within the game. And they studied their pain pathways and it turns out pain pathways occur when you get socially excluded. And pain threshold goes down, more sensitive to pain when you're in an emotionally upset state. I talked about childhood victimization. We know that fibromyalgia is associated with higher rates of childhood victimization. We know that migraine headaches, interstitial cystitis, or painful bladder syndrome, pelvic pain, irritable bowel are associated with higher rates of childhood adversity. And when you study people in prospective ways, when you study, uh, you do MRIs on them, and then five years later another MRI, and you do psychological variables, and five years later repeat that, the, M the change in the MRI are not correlated with people who get or don't get back pain. The psychological variables are correlated with if you get or don't get back pain. And a study in Norway found that back pain, so people doing uh, physical work with their arms, that pain was associated with issues related to their bosses and their leadership and their decision making not associated with how much work they were doing. When you get a, a back injury, you go to the emergency room and they scan your brain as they did in the study from Chicago, and then they follow you. It turns out the people who are more likely to develop chronic back pain are those who have this uh, functional connectivity between the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex, which is an emotionally laden component. So you can predict who's more likely to develop chronic pain. And in a study from Chicago, John Burns lab, when they took people with back pain and they had them recall a time when they were angry, he measured that their back muscles tightened up. Emotion connected to physical pain. And it turns out that the central sensitization has a whole variety of syndromes associated with it. From TMJ, migraine, tension, headache, irritable bowel, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, PTSD. Well, PTSD, that's an anxiety problem. You have a stressful event and then you have phobias, flashbacks, anxiety, fears. But it's kind of the same. These all go together. Next slide. PTSD is related to fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome and vice versa. You can train your brain to stop pain. Here's a study from Stanford where they train people to change their brain to reduce pain by biofeedback. So what do I do? I take a lot of time with my patients to get their whole life story. Did they have a difficult childhood that set up the pathways for fear and danger pathways in their life? Do they have many of these other associated symptoms? That's a pattern that you're seeing. What was the injury? How severe was the injury? And when did the pain start? With a typical injury, you get pain, and then it gets better. It heals. With a mind-body type pain, the injury occurs, and then over time, you rest, and the pain gets worse. That's not typical pattern of normal healing. The healing occurs, but the brain is taken over to produce pain. Are the symptoms inconsistent and variable, as I mentioned with my friend with the heel pain? Uh, is the physical exam significant? Like the guy with the hip where you can't move his hip? Well, there's a hip problem. Or can they move the hip fine, but it hurts like, like crazy? And what do the tests show? Is the MRI showing normal aging, which is what my MRI shows of my neck? I've got gray hair, right? It's normal aging to have gray hair. It doesn't hurt. Well, sometimes it hurts. <laughs> So I'm looking for this pattern. I teach a class, it's a four week intervention. I help people understand that they have a psychophysiologic disorder as opposed to a structural disorder, if they in fact do. If they understand that, if they believe that, then it opens up hope and optimism and belief that they can get better. Not just cope with their pain, but resolve it. It's a huge factor in making people better. And then I help them do what that guy was doing with walking on his heel. I help them change how they relate to the pain and stop being afraid of it and stop 
babying. I don't know how many times I've had people come in and their doctor has said, you're going to have to baby your back the rest of your life. That's horrible advice because you're creating more fear and fear creates more pain. And I do emotional interventions because at the core are emotions. So I saw a guy who was an engineer, worked for one of the auto companies, back pain for five years, started, he had a history of irritable bowel and some anxiety, back pain started when his daughter was, a, he had four daughters, three were perfect. His job was perfect, well his job wasn't perfect, his wife was perfect, but his third daughter was not perfect, bipolar, running around, drug abuse, running away, you name it. And this guy, this meek, mild-mannered engineer, now is punching the walls in his house. He doesn't know what to do, and he gets back pain. Now I'm seeing him five years later, he still has back pain. He has bulging discs, all this stuff on his MRI, but it's normal. It's what everyone else has. And so now his daughter's better. Five years later, she's doing okay. And I ask him to go back in time to that moment when he was so upset and so angry. And just with me, not with his daughter, but just with me, I ask him to feel those feelings. And he says, you know what, I'm, I was so angry, I didn't know what to do. I, I was so angry. What, what does that anger say to your daughter? He starts speaking to his daughter. She's not there. Speaking to his daughter, you bitch, you this, I hate you. What are you doing to me? What are you doing to our family? You're ruining our family. I can't stand you. It's disgusting. I wish you were never born. And all of a sudden, the anger drains out of him. And he starts to cry. Starts to sob. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Now he's saying, now he's speaking to his daughter still. I am so sorry. I love you. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to treat you. I, I, I can't believe it. Uh, and he's just sobbing through all this. And this guilt is coming out. And the grief is coming out. And he says, I have to tell you, I have to tell you. And he goes away. He comes back a week later. His pain is 90% better. He spent four hours with his daughter, had the best time he's had since she was a little girl. And what did he tell her? I'm sorry, I love you. And so the emotional healing, and I don't know, you can understand, that's different than talking about something. This is emotional work, which is very powerful and not all that hard to do. What I've learned over the years of doing this. And then sometimes you need to make changes in your life. I ha had a woman who, uh, her sister-in-law was spreading rumors about her that she was cheating on her husband, and she wasn't. And she just put up with it somehow. And finally she said, you know what, this is driving me nuts. I have to do something about this. So she talked to her, sat her down, told her this is, you know, you can't do this anymore. She stood up for herself. She changed something in her life where she had been beaten down and afraid to act. And that made the difference for her. So I asked my patients to put themselves in charge. I asked them to change the view of the hero of their story. That the hero of their story is not doctors who are going to fix them like an ER or house. They're not going to find some weird, bizarre syndrome that no one ever heard of that only house knows about and now they're cured. They're the hero of their story. They're going to fix themselves. And we have data showing that more than half people more than half the people with average duration of pain of nine years have more than a 50% improvement in pain after a short intervention at a six-month follow-up. And we're doing a randomized controlled trial now, an NIH-funded trial. So these are the questions that I ask my patients. Number one, what was your childhood like? Was there priming events that affected you? Two. Have you had traumatic experiences in your life, such as emotional abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, abandonment, neglect? What other diagnoses have you had? Make a list. And what began at the time that each of these things occurred? Next. 
So this is an example of a patient who had a variety of checks on the list of stomach pain, headache pain, back pain, neck pain, etc., anxiety, depression. These are the things that occurred at the time her symptoms began. You begin to put the pieces together by just taking a detailed history. And when I asked her, how would you describe your father? Hardworking, but cruel. How would you describe your mother? Passive and loving. So the pain is real. All pain is real. But not all pain is caused by a tissue damage problem. By looking very carefully at people, examining them, putting all the, the medical information and psychological information together, we can understand that sometimes stress triggers neural pathways that cause pain and other symptoms. Everyone has this to some degree. It's part of being human. It's how our brains work and it's how our bodies work. This condition is reversible. You don't simply have to manage it. I can't say that all my patients have Im immediate cures. They don't. It takes hard work. And a lot of people are not interested in this work and not willing to do this work. In fact, the majority of people are not interested in this work. And I saw a lady with trigeminal neuralgia last week, and she's better. She's great after three years. But when she first started with trigeminal neuralgia, she said, there's no way I would have... I would have been interested in this. No way. If someone had told me this, I would have been pissed off and be upset with them. They're implying that it's not real. It's all in my head. And we're not saying that. But it takes, it takes time sometimes. And now she's, she's tried all the therapies. It didn't work. I'm not saying they don't always work, but for her, it didn't work. And now she's better. And... My last slide, uh, I have a friend in Seattle who works in a pain clinic. And he said, you know what? I've been working in the field of pain management for many years. I was aware that chronic pain could occur in relation to traumatic experiences, but I didn't know what to do with it. I would offer support, help people cope with their pain, and med use medication if the injections or surgery didn't work. But since I've understood now that the mind commonly generates pain, and I've learned how to recognize that process, I realize, this is his words, that the majority of my patients have this syndrome. Now, I don't work in a pain clinic. I work, people come to me, and so when I speak to doctors who work in pain, they say, oh, your patients are different. Our patients aren't like that. But this is a guy who worked in a pain clinic for many years, and once he began to look for this diagnosis and this syndrome, he feels Again, his words, that the majority of us, but not all, but the majority of the patients have this and can get better. So I want to thank you very much for having me. And, uh, yeah. The medical world doesn't want to acknowledge that that's possible, that there's power there. And we all fall in line as practitioners, right. not talking about psych psychologists yes. right, and such, right. but right. we fall in line that we, well, A plus B equals C, and we don't want to deal with the other because it's like a black hole. It is. And it would require so much time, so many resources, so much effort that we're left <coughs> powerless. And consequently, we put blinders up and we're missing it. Right. Absolutely. I went to a big pain clinic. They said, the psychologist told me 1% of their patients have what I'm describing. 1%, that's what he said. I said, I don't know how you could possibly say that. He's not looking for it. And I have a friend who worked in his clinic, and he said, it's probably 60%. What is he talking about? We don't want to see it. It's much easier to not challenge the view, because the patients don't want to hear it. Right? The doctors don't want to admit it or think about it because they don't know what to do with it. It's much easier to give a pill, give a shot, and, and the, from the patient's point of view, it's much easier to let somebody fix me. So what I'm asking people to do is hard. But from a resource point of view, it's much cheaper, what I'm doing, than what we're spending. Because what we're spending is trillions of dollars on chronic pain. The guy who discovered that hand washing saved women's lives in delivery, childbirth, this guy named Semmelweis in Germany, he was ridiculed. He ended up in an insane asylum. 
this guy, for, for positing this notion that you need to wash your hands between deliveries. And now, we know that. Times have changed. I truly believe, and this may not happen in my lifetime or our lifetime, but <laughs> I hope it will, but I truly believe that this work is going to change, change medicine. And we need more and more people discovering it. Yeah. So how can we affect change in the pain clinic where we work? When we're dealing with these patients day in, day out, day in, day out, and we're doing medical intervention. Well, what we can do, if you're working in a pain clinic, you can begin to ask the question. A simple question, number one, how many of these other symptoms have you had? You know, you're here for back pain, but have you had in your life headaches, anxiety, depression, TMJ, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, heartburn? I have a list, right? Just check. When you see check, 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 it's not just one, it's not a problem in the back, most likely. It's a problem in the life. That's one thing. It's simple to do. Second thing is, tell me what your father was like, tell me what your mother. They can write that down. Have you had any traumatic experiences in your life? Question. You can write it down. Those, those questions. And then, what was going on in your life at the time that the pain started? Those are the only questions you need to ask. And if you begin to see patterns, and some people, you know, for some people, they'll say, no, 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 no. But for a lot of people, they'll say, oh, my God. And then you can begin to say, what's going on with so-and-so? And could there be something that's there? I wrote a book on this. I have a website. There's lots of other books on this. Uh, my teacher was Dr. Sarno, John Sarno, S-A-R-N-O, in New York. He was, he's 91. He just retired last year. He's got books that sell. I have a friend in Seattle, Dr. Hanscom, who wrote a book called Back in Control. He's a back surgeon who's doing this work. Uh, my book is called Unlearn Your Pain. There's a website called tmswiki.org, which is an amazing website. It's all peer-run. People who, are, who have been struggling uh, with pain and, and, uh, uh, and working on it from a mind-body point of view. So uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, sticking around. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.